Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming out tonight and uh, thank you Soho House for hosting us. Um, and welcome again to the One Series. This is a series of dialogues that's been going on for a while now around the subjects of technology and human consciousness, uh, environment and empowerment. Uh, the One Series is a precursor to a bigger project that we're currently working on, my business partner Alshlag Magnus daughter in Iceland called One. Um, and it's a future living facility, but I'm not gonna go too much into that, but uh, we're honored to be here, and um, thank you again. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers and guests this evening, Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel. Stephen will be hosting the conversation this evening and will be hosting the One Series quarterly this year, which we're thrilled about. Um, Stephen is a New York Times bestselling author, an award-winning journalist, and the co-founder director of research for the Flow Genome Project. He's one of the world's leading experts on high-performance disruptive technology and innovation. He's also the author of eight books, including his new one, Stealing Fire, which he wrote with Jamie, uh, as well as The Rise of Superman, Tomorrowland, Bold, and Abundance. Alongside his wife, Stephen is the co-founder of Rancho de Chihuahua, a dog sanctuary in the mountains of northern New Mexico. Jamie Wheel is an expert on peak performance and leadership, specializing in the neuroscience and application of flow states. He has advised everyone from the US Naval War College and Special Operations Command, the athletes of Red Bull, and the owners of NFL, NBA, MLB, and Premier League teams, to the executives of Google, Deloitte, Cisco, and Young President's Organization. I'm thrilled to invite Stephen and Jamie up on stage. Everyone, please yes. enjoy your evening. Thank please you. Please give them a round of applause. Thanks. Good evening, guys. How you doing? Come on, we can do better than that. I'm feeling lonely up here. All right. Um, hi, I'm Steven. This is Jamie. So, a real pleasure to be with you guys. I want to thank Auschlag and John for allowing us to do this. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about tonight. First of all, the last time I got to talk at the Soho House was just some of the most fun I've actually had on a talk. Um, this also is going to be it's a sneak preview. Uh, we're going to be talking about our new book, Stealing Fire. You guys are probably the first group of people to hear about it. So, brand new content for all of you. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about kind of brings together a lot of things that are really kind of core to my heart. We're going to be talking a lot about consciousness and human performance. We're also going to be talking a little bit about solving core environmental problems. And we're going to bring those things together, hopefully, which I've actually never gotten to do out loud. And we're going to see if it works or if it's confusing. <laughs> and I sort of want to start out by giving you uh, kind of a little information about what Stealing Fire is actually about. It's about a giant underground revolution in hacking consciousness and high performance. It's going on right now, and it's probably going to impact most of our lives if it hasn't already. And with that, I'm going to kind of kick it over to Jamie and let, you, let him fill in a few of the details about this revolution. Thanks, Stephen. So, so really, this was this was a sort of uh, like a Scooby-Doo mystery for us because we were about four years ago. Uh, Stephen wrote a book called *The Rise of Superman*, and it was about peak performance and flow states. And so, we found ourselves going to high-performing organizations, special operations, military, elite athletes, all those kind of folks, and then from there, speaking to Fortune 1,000 companies, all sorts of people became really interested in this stuff. And as we were traveling the country and the world we were talking about this specific state known as flow, and here's all the neurobiology, and here's how to do it, and here's how to get more of it. And we thought we were kind of stretching the envelopes of corporate culture and what was possible. And time and time again, 
we would sort of have these furtive little meetings in the hallway or, or at dinner over drinks. And people would come up to us, kind of sidle up to us and say, hey, can, can, I, can I ask you a question? And we'd say, yeah, sure, what about it? And we're like, well, uh, you know, we're engaged in, uh, we're doing um, meditation or we're stacking off prescription pharmaceuticals or we're zapping our brains with neurotech or we're microdosing psychedelics, what do you think? And we'd be like, hey, whoa, <laughs> not, not our bailiwick. But it happened enough that we're like, we think that we might have been kind of peddling a PG-13 version of what was actually a much, much bigger event. And as soon as we started traveling the world, and this was everything from, you know, Necker Island to Burning Man to the Googleplex to, you know, Dhaka's outside of Moscow where, you know, former KGB youth turned good guys were hosting ayahuasca ceremonies with Peruvian shamans in the Great Pyramid of Giza as team building. You're like, what the fuck? What is going on here? <laughs> so, so really, we kind of accidentally found ourselves on the trail of this secret revolution. And I mean, anybody heard of Burning Man in the audience, mm -hmm. right? Re anybody been to Burning Man? Keep your hands up. Freaks, 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 yes. Um, <laughs> what we notice is like, you know, if you, if you follow the press on even just something like Burning Man, you know, it, it sort of tends to fall in two categories. One is naked hippies doing drugs in the desert, the kind of salacious side. And then the other is the kind of starfucker side, right? Who's been there? P oh, there's P. Diddy, there's Katy Perry on a Segway, yay, right? But nothing in between. No one's ever asking, look, man, for the people with money, power, and influence who could be anywhere that week of August, right? They could be behind any velvet rope. They could be pimping it on any large boat in the Caribbean they want. They're there in the middle of bumfuck Egypt, hot, dusty, cold. What is going on, right, around this secret revolution? So we found it happening in the strangest of places. We found it happening with the most connected, influential and even inspirational subset of the population. And we found there to be radio silence about what was actually going on. And because we'd been tracking the neurobiology of flow states, we kind of understood the mechanisms, what it takes to shift consciousness. And that functioned like this accidental Rosetta Stone. Once we realized, oh, hey, the things that these people are doing, meditation, sexuality, smart tech, neurotropics, psychedelics, dance, right, EDM, all of these things. Once you realize that under the hood, they share the same neurobiological mechanisms, we realize, wow, these things, these strange bedfellows are actually of a feather. And we started trying to track down exactly how big this revolution was. The first thing we did was, um, we sort of followed Peter Drucker's advice. So Peter Drucker famously said, you know, if I want to know what you believe and I ask you what you believe and you tell me, maybe I'll believe you. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. This is not the exact quote. But if you show me your bank statement and you show me your calendar, then I might believe you. So we decided we wanted to follow the money. And what we looked at is what we called the altered state economy. It was how much time and money are we spending globally trying to change the channel on waking state consciousness, trying to get out of our heads and get someplace else. And now, mind you, what we had been looking at and what Jamie had been talking about, these were conscious and intentional shifts of consciousness. But a lot of what is going on, obviously, in the world in our altered states economy is unconscious, less intentional, sometimes addictive. So this is not kind of a po just the positive side of it. We just wanted to put a number around how much money are people spending trying to shift their consciousness, trying to turn off waking state consciousness and get someplace else. And we were extremely, extremely conservative in our calculations. And we started the obvious places. We started with how much money we spend on licit and illicit pharmaceuticals, the obvious places. Then we moved on to things like psychology, self-help, all the, all the stuff where it's helped me get out of my head, helped me feel better, not so much skill acquisition. We also looked at things like music, and we wanted to be very, very cautious. So you can make an argument that anytime anybody attends a live music event, right, part of the goal is get me out of my head, help me merge with the crowd, let's produce that communal feeling, communitas is what it's called, the communal altered state. We said, okay, there are a lot of other reasons people go to see live music, so let's not take the whole of the live music category, let's just squeeze it down to EDM, because in EDM, there's no band, there's nothing to see, there's just a lot of lights, a lot of sound, 
and a lot of mind-altering substances. So there's very but little there is a guy. There is a guy in a hoodie there up front. There is a guy in a hoodie up front. He's right. Um, there's very little reason to seek it out other than the state change it produces. We also looked at social media. Now, one of the interesting things about the neurobiology of flow, and we'll talk more about it a little bit, or the neurobiology of non-ordinary states of consciousness, is there's five or six neurochemicals that get triggered by it. One of the main ones is dopamine. Dopamine is technically a focusing chemical, right? It's a performance-enhancing chemical. It's also a very powerful feel-good drug. And whenever you check your phone and you find a new text there, that little rush of pleasure you get, that's dopamine. It is a state-changing chemical. So we looked at social media. And again, we were really conservative. We said, OK, you can make an argument. There's a lot of really addictive behavior around social media. If you're waking up first thing in the morning and you're checking your phone before you're saying good morning to your spouse, that's sort of addictive behavior where you're chasing a state change rather than just trying to figure out what your messages are. So we took 10% of social media, very conservative numbers, and we kept going this way. We worked at it for about six months with a team of researchers, and the figure we ended up coming up with as a global number was $4 trillion. Now, again, as I said, that's a very conservative figure. We're probably off by a factor two, so it's probably $8 trillion. $4 trillion is one sixteenth of the global economy. It is larger than the GDP of India. It is larger than the GDP of Russia. It is roughly 25% of the US economy. And nobody's talking about it. And that is how much time and money we are spending annually trying to change our consciousness. Huge, huge, huge number. So the next question, of course, that we had to ask is if, oh my god, there's a $4 trillion market out there. How the hell did we not hear about it? Why don't we know about it? Yeah, so so that was, the, you know, why isn't this like front page news Time magazine? Why isn't it sort of the, the person of the year is like getting twisted? You know, <laughs> you would, you'd, th you'd think four trillion bucks, that's a lot. And I mean, just to give you another comparison, because we're all quasi, you know, innumerate when it comes to really big numbers. Yeah, um, four trillion is twice the number of galaxies in the known universe. We spend that every year just trying to get out of our own heads. So the question is, is how could something that giant be hiding under the rug and no one notice? And there's really a couple of reasons. The, f the first is um, that you know, the, the categories we're talking about when we talk about non-ordinary states, we have roughly bucketed as meditation and mystical states, flow states, and psychedelic states, or pharmacologically primed or prompted states, right? And we've called that that cat all of those together the category of ecstasis. And we and we got that term from the commander of DevGru or SEAL Team Six. And he was basically saying that when their teams go onto operations, they do something pretty pretty magical as a unit. They and he calls that term flipping the switch, which was basically uh, the the state of ecstasis is from the old Greek, and it means to step outside yourself. And so all of these categories, from meditation and mystical states to flow states to psychedelic states, all do that same thing. And they do it with remarkably similar mechanisms as far as what's happening in our bodies and brains. But if you think about it, right, who, and this is, this is just tribal balkanization, because who owns meditation, right? I mean, it's monks and mystics. Who owned flow states? It was artists and athletes. Who owned psychedelics? It was hippies and ravers, right? And never the twain shall meet. Right? I mean, you know, how many snooty yogis would, would, would you know, look down their nose right, at steakhead athletes right, or druggies? And then how many counterculture folks would say, oh, the pious and mighty Zen folks are the ones we really want to talk to? So these groups never talk to each other. And in fact, in reality, when you realize, oh, the mechanisms and the outcomes are all doing remarkably similar things, we realize, ah, that is an underground revolution that even the participants don't recognize they're a part of. And one of the easiest places to see this was, you know, we, we, uh, we were presenting at a biohacking conference in LA a couple of years ago. And you had, you know, yoked steakhead CrossFit guys who were stacking nootropics and working out and doing Tough Mudder stuff. And because of Joe Rogan's podcast, we're also like puffing tough on DMT. And you're like, what the hell are those guys doing with the most <laughs> potent psychedelic on the planet? This is really strange. And then you had, you know, an orgasmic meditation booth where you've got suburban housewives, you know, literally getting their rocks off with strangers based on an app and then and calling it meditation. And you had like 
like you know sexless tech nerds up up in Silicon Valley. Again, you know, microdosing with psychedelics. So none of those people would have ever recognized each other in the street. They would have walked past each other and never for once said, hey, we're part of something similar. So that fragmentation and that tribalism is a big part of what was keeping it missing. So that's on the kind of social level. But on the sort of more historical cultural level, there's an even bigger reason. And, and it's the simple sense is that this revolution has been happening beyond the pale of polite society, outside the perimeter fence. Right? So it was either a cloistered priest class, right? We kept this stuff really close to the vest. Only a handful of folks knew about it. You had to get, kind of get the invite, prove yourself. Or it was misfits, misfits and outcasts. And that pale, right, that perimeter fence of mainstream societal norms and exceptions has three big planks in it. And it's the pale of the church, the pale of the state, and the pale of the body. And the pale of the church fundamentally says, you know, at most every religion was founded with an ecstatic experience from its, from its originator, right? They come down the mountain with their hair on fire, they got a story to tell and people buy it, right? But anybody after that, they shut the door behind them and they say anybody who attempts to recreate that experience after we've set this thing in stone is either a heretic or immoral or both. All right. Now, the pale of the church uh, follows hot on that heels, which is that in a nutshell, we have state-sanctioned states. State. Sorry, the pale of the state. That we have state-sanctioned states of consciousness. There are channels of awareness that we endorse and support, and there are channels that we vilify and repress. And it's not always as logical and straightforward right, as it would seem. So take David Nutt. Does anybody know Dr. David Nutt? He was the uh, Minister of Drug Harms in the United Kingdom. He was charged a few, you know, four or five years ago with assessing all drug harms. That was his job. And he ranked them top 20 worst drugs for us. And heroin topped the list. Alcohol came in number two. Cannabis was number six or seven, and LSD, psilocybin, and MDMA were 16, 17, and 19, respectively. Okay, and, he, and then the newspaper said, drug minister claims, right, LSD, no, that alcohol more dangerous than LSD. And he got called before their equivalent of the Homeland Secretary, right, H House of Parliament, the whole bit, and fired even though his results were published in The Lancet, right, one of the most respectable medical journals in the world, and, and yet they threatened the state-sanctioned states of consciousness. And two of the top 10 offenders on that list, alcohol and tobacco, right, are completely culturally san sanctioned and enshrined in the coffee break, the smoke break, and happy hour. You think about what keeps, in, in, a, in a market economy, what, keepers, what keeps workers alert, primed, and w working for as long as possible, are uh, the stimulants, nicotine and caffeine, with alcohol as the, as, the, you know, as the downer on the back end. So we endorse and support things that culturally we enshrine and we vilify those, regardless of actual objective evidence, that may or may not be less harmful. And then the final one is the pale of the body. And the pale of the body is a little slipperier fish, but it's fundamentally the, what is known as the skin bag bias. What happens inside this bag of skin, my body, right? whether it's meditation, whether it's reflection, whether it's psychotherapy, personal development, that's stable, true, and trusted. What happens outside my skin bag, whether a chemical or technical intervention, right? I could be taking a substance, I could be putting on a, a, a bit of smart tech or neurotech that gets me to similar places is seen as cheating or unreliable. So those three pales or, or planks have blocked our view of this revolution that's actually taking place outside of town, outside of polite society. And so Stephen now is just going to take us, to, you know, if that's true, and if this is truly four trillion bucks worth of our time, effort, and energy, then is it worth it? Is this a fool's errand? Is this a waste of our time and money? Or is there something, presumably, intuitively, that we're searching for that matters and is worth all of that risk and all of that cost? Kind of lay that out for you guys. Um, the last time I actually got to speak at the Soho House, uh, I did a talk with Jason Silva. Does, do, are you guys familiar with Jason Silva's work? He's the host of National Geographic Brain Games. And uh, he was called the, uh, the Timothy Leary, the viral video generation. He puts up makes viral videos, art videos that 
talking about altered states of consciousness and human performance and technology, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Jason actually was born in Venezuela. He was born into a middle-class family and everything was great and rosy and his life was fantastic. And around the time he was 12 years old, his parents got divorced. Uh, his father lost all his money when the Venezuelan economy tanked. Then Venezuela absolutely fell apart. There were two coups, crime and corruption skyrocketed. Every member of his family was held up at gunpoint, including his grandmother. His father was kidnapped. And Jason essentially developed low-grade PTSD. He became a shut-in. He could not leave his house. He was terrified. Every time his mom wasn't home by 5 o'clock, oh my God, had she gotten killed? Had she been kidnapped? This went on and on. By the time he got to high school, in sort of a last-ditch attempt to sort of salvage his sanity and his social life, he started bringing people into his house every Friday night. He was very inspired by Baudelaire's hashish salons. So he got people together to just... Some people drank wine, some people smoked pot, everybody talked philosophy. That was the whole point. And during the course of the evening when Jason started talking philosophy, he would drop into these astounding states of consciousness, astounding deep flow states where he would just care, get carried away with the ideas, his whole sense of self would disappear, time seemed to vanish for him, he seemed to be propelled forward by this force he couldn't understand. and. That's actually where his videos started to come from. He actually started to ask his friends, hey, can you film me? Because I, I just want to make sure I'm not sounding like a babbling idiot, right? Can you put a camera on me and let, let's just look at it afterwards? And he started looking at the videos. And what he realized is, even though he was worried he was a babbling idiot, what was coming out of his mouth was very, very, very cogent. And he had no idea really where it was coming from. And over a period of months, as he kept doing this and kept doing this, his really kind of, when I say Jason had PTSD, um, years later, he looked at a 17-point PTSD scale. He finally got to see one. And it basically, if you check off four or five of these things, you probably have, have an issue. He had checked off 16 out of 17. So he was pretty clearly over that line. And but very slowly over time, his symptoms started to diminish, and this wellspring of creativity started to rise up in him. Where was it coming from? What was going on? Well, it turns out there's good reasons for this kind of transformation, and for that to make sense, I have to talk about a little bit about what goes on in non-ordinary states of consciousness, what goes on in the flow states Jason was experiencing, and what qualities they have. So I'll walk you a little bit through the science of what happens as we move into these kind of non-ordinary states and what it does for us. So a couple different things. If you want to talk about what happens in the brain, you really have to talk about three different things. You have to talk about neural anatomy, which is where in the brain something takes place. You have to talk about neurochemistry and neural electricity, which are the two ways the brain communicates with it, which is how the brain sends signals. Neural anatomically, as we move into these states, one of their core characteristics, they have four characteristics. We use the acronym STIR to describe them. Selflessness, our normal sense of self disappears. Timelessness, we're pulled out of this normal slipstream of time. Past and future tend to disappear, and we're pulled into what psychologists talk about as the deep now. Effort, the effortlessness is the next one, and I mentioned that earlier. Instead of the normal struggle and toil of daily life, we seem to be propelled forward by a much deeper, more potent motivation. And the last category is richness. That's short for information richness. It seems like in these states, we tap into a deeper level of information, a level of information we don't normally have access to. The Greeks like to talk about it as divine inspiration. We assigned agency to it. Oh, the muses were speaking to you. Where that's coming from is actually changes in neurobiology. So in all of these states that Jamie described earlier, in psychedelic states, in meditative and mystical states, in flow states, we see significant changes in the brain. The first thing that happens is activity in your prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's right back here prefrontal cortex starts to deactivate. It quiets down. This is actually an efficiency exchange. When we're in these states, focus gets very, very deeply enhanced. 
And the brain performs a trade-off. It says, okay, you need more attention in the present, so I'll give you more energy for focus, and I'll shut down non-essential parts of the brain. The technical term for this is transient hypofrontality. Transient means temporary. Hypo is the opposite of hyper. It means to slow down, to deactivate. And frontality is the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right back here. Now, this is why your sense of self disappears in flow states, in psychedelic states, in meditative states. Turns out your sense of self is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. It's actually a complex network. And as parts of that network start to shut down, as nodes go down, we lose the ability to generate our sense of self. Now we experience this as liberation. As our sense of self goes, our inner critic also shuts up. So that nagging, always on, defeatist voice in your head, your inner Woody Allen, in these states, Woody goes quiet. So we feel this as liberation, as freedom. We're actually getting out of our own way. Same thing happens with time. Well, and just, and just, a, just a quick show of hands. How many folks have experienced that? How many folks have experienced those moments where the inner nag, right, that constant narrator has actually gone offline mm. for seconds or minutes? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, and then keep your hands up if that was actually something you favored or, or enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, us too, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that's back to the four trillion. Like, we're willing to say, just, just get, get it off, please, right? Same thing happens to our sense of time. Time turns out to be calculated all over the prefrontal cortex as well. So as parts of it start to wink out, we lose our ability to separate past from present, from future. So we're plunged into that deep now. Again, this is incredibly liberating. If you think about most of your fears, most of your anxieties, they don't reside in the present moment. They're either things that happened in the past that were desperate to avoid happening again, or things we're concerned about in the future. So as we lose the ability to calculate time and are plunged into this deep now, we once again experience this as freedom, as liberation. The effortlessness that we experience comes from a different place. So as we move into these states, five to six different neurochemicals come online in varying concentrations. I'll just give you the list. There's going to be a quiz later, so you might want to write it down. It's norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, anandamide, endorphins, and oxytocin. So these neurochemicals do a lot of different things, but one of the main things that they do is they're all essentially pleasure drugs. In fact, all of these endogenous, meaning internal to our body chemicals, have external analogs. So for example, when we talk about norepinephrine, which you feel as either anxiety or excitement, butterflies in your stomach, that kind of thin, reedy feeling, that's norepinephrine in your body. The external version of norepinephrine is speed. Anandamine is the same psych psychoactive inside of marijuana. So very, very pleasurable. It's a pain-killing drug, but it also gives you that expansive feeling. Dopamine, which I said earlier, it's a focusing chemical. It's another pleasure drug. The external analog is cocaine. Serotonin, depending on the pathway it takes in the brain, is either ecstasy or LSD. Endorphins, another internal painkiller, pleasure drug, are actually the external version are opiates like heroin and morphine and oxycontin. So a couple interesting things. If you actually tried to cocktail the street drug version of these chemicals, you're gonna end up in a coma or dead. Doesn't work, cannot do it. The brain does it naturally. So that sense of effortlessness, that sense of being propelled by, by life, of the, by a force bigger than yourself, that's actually a shit ton of pleasure drugs working together in your brain, providing an incredible boost in motivation. Great example of this comes from flow. So, and it comes from kind of a business world. Right now, a recent study done by Gallup found that 84% of American workers are disengaged or actively disengaged on the job. Active disengagement, by the way, is my favorite euphemism. It means I hate what I do so much, I'm gonna go out of my way to sabotage my company. <laughs> the remaining 16% have jobs that tend to produce flow. The people who have those jobs are ideal workers. They're incredibly motivated. They show up early, they stay late, they love their jobs, right? Where is this coming from? It's coming from these six neurochemicals that show up. 
Yeah, and Jonathan Hagel uh, at the Center for the Edge for Deloitte uh, has also done comparable studies and found that the organizations and teams, especially in innovation and, and pushing forward projects, the ones that go the furthest and report the greatest satisfaction, cohesion, and validated results are the ones that spend their most time in these states of consciousness, specifically flow. The last, the last bit of the stir analogy, right? Richness. So Jason's experience, right? He seemed to tap into a level of creativity it never seen before. Where was it coming from? What was going on? Was you know was this divine inspiration? What was going on? Well, it turns out these chemicals all massively heighten information processing in the brain. For example, norepinephrine and dopamine. As I said, they do lots of things. They heighten focus. They're pleasure drugs. One of the other things they do is they tune signal to noise ratios. That's a fancy way of saying they enhance pattern recognition. They also enhance information acquisition. So when these chemicals are flowing through our system, we take in more information per second. We have a much easier time finding connections between that incoming information and older ideas. So we make big leaps, ideas kind of come together and form. So we process this information more deeply using more parts of our brain and more quickly. We experience this as a huge boost in creativity. I'll give you one simple example, a study that was done in Australia, really interesting study. So they used in this particular study, you can artificially induce these states through brain stimulation. You can basically use transcranial magnetic stimulation, shoot a weak magnetic pulse through people's prefrontal cortex, and knock it out and induce a 20 to 40 minute artificial flow state, essentially. So using this technology, they took a group of 43 people, 46 people, excuse me, and they gave them the nine dot problem. And we've all seen this. It's nine dots in a square, and the idea is can you connect all nine of these dots with four lines in 10 minutes without lifting your pencil from the paper? As a general rule, less than 5% of the population can actually pull this off. It's a very difficult creative problem to solve. And when they gave it to all 46 of these people to try, nobody could solve it. They brought in another group of 46 people. They used transcranial magnetic stimulation to knock out their prefrontal cortex. 46% of this group solved the problem in record time. So massive increase in creative problem solving, massive increase in data processing. That's just where that information richness is coming from, that final characteristic. So what we see in these states, and we'll, we'll, later we'll talk a little bit about how they healed trauma and how they actually worked on his PTSD, but I, I wanted to get to the second half of it and what, where they really led him to. And, and if you talk to Jason about this experience, he will tell you that his entire career emerged out of these non-ordinary states of consciousness. In fact, his first job, the videos that he started making, got him hired by Al Gore's network, Current TV. And he, you know, his career was rising, it was awesome, but he didn't get to go off on these crazy monologues anymore. He was just mostly reading from a teleprompter, and even though it was his dream job, he quit because he couldn't get access to the very states he needed, and he actually started making videos, and that's what's led to his phenomenal career. Yeah, yeah, actually, just a quick question. How, how many folks here have left what maybe parents or some friends and things would say was a cushy layup of a job or a career to do something more uncertain, to do something entrepreneurial, right? Okay, the odds are, in addition to sort of being your own master and having more control of your life, the, the odds are good is that you were steering towards mo a more flow-prone or flow-likely uh, work environment where there's uncertainty, there's challenge, there's novelty, right? And there's that total commitment and feeling of aliveness. And, and if anybody knows or has had the experience of being a founder that's had their, their business acquired strategically, right? And there's the golden handcuffs for two or three years. If here's your earn out, you'll, you'll make a bundle more cash if you just hang on and make sure, you know, make sure the transition goes well. And then seeing those folks quit anyway and leave money on the table Right. The reason they do that is, to, is quite often to get back to more of these states versus the slow death inside a big bureaucratic organization where that's taken away. So, you know, back to the four trillion bucks, how much do we spend seeking this stuff intentionally and unintentionally? And then even professional choices or even relational choices where we will blow things up that everyone around us goes, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And it might not be that we're crazy. It might just be that intuitively we're seeking to go back to this well again. Another add another emphasis point on it, 
And this is research that we're trying to do, but uh, Salim Ismail, who's a friend of ours, he's the global ambassador for Singularity University, he's the former head of innovation for Yahoo. He believes, and he's argued pretty coherently, that we know only one out of 10 startups survive, right? And what is the defining factor? What actually does it? His argument is that the startup that actually produces the most flow tends to be the one that survives. And one of the main reasons is both that kind of boost in motivation you get from these states and that heightened creative problem solving that you get in these states. It seems to really be able to lift up businesses and may be kind of one of the key distinguishing features. Now, of course, clearly, this is not the very first time there's been a revolution in non-ordinary states of consciousness, right? We've been down this road before. We've seen this before. What we think, what we think is going on is we think it's different this time. And we think there are four reasons for that. I'm going to kick it over to Jamie and let him tell you about them. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the simplest is, you know, first we say there's this giant revolution worth a ton of money. We should be seeing it, but we're not. And we said, hey, we might be missing it because the varying constituents, the revolutionaries, don't know each other, right? They're in fragmented cells, and it's happening outside mainstream view and approval. But the question is, is why now? Why were we able to write this book in 2017? Why are you guys, why are we all together tonight to talk about it, and not 10 years ago, not 50 years ago? And the, what it seems like, and even, even back into the 60s, right? I mean, the 60s took a level swing at this. And it, and it didn't fully mature and play out. And we would make the case that right now we stand, probably in the last three to five years, um, in a truly novel situation, is the intersection of four forces, what we call the four forces for ecstasis. And those are psychology, neurobiology, pharmacology, and technology. And they each do something, something complementary to the other that makes this a potential change in the game. And the first is psychology. So if you, if you think about, you know, end of World War II, 1950s, straightjacket America, right? That was a very limited sense of self. There was sort of Betty Homemaker. There was Organization Man. It's classic Leave it to Beaverland. And if you want any of those things, right, you masked it. You repressed it. You kept it in. You self-medicated it. Mama's little helper and a stiff scotch after work. Deal. Right? And then you had the 60s, and you end up with things like Esalen. You end up with pillow-thumping, gestalt ther therapy sessions. You end up with permission to get in touch with your primal goddess. You get you know, all this whole broadening spectrum of what it means to be human and what is the permissible boundaries right, of psychological expression. So we just gained more tools. We gained more abilities. And if you think about today, you've got Comic-Con and furries and things like Burning Man and online experiences where we not only do we get more expression and permission to try on different elements of ourselves, but we literally get to try on different, different versions of our, of, of our characters. We get to play superheroes for days on end and start inhabiting those experiences. And if you, you know, contrast 1950s repressed mother's little helper housewife to transgender Victoria's Secret model walking the runway to standing ovation, right? That's how far we've come as far as what's permissible and embraced and acceptable. So psychology is a huge one. The next one's neurobiology. So psychology gives us more room to roam inside our heads. Neurobiology does something totally different because we can map all of these non-ordinary states of consciousness. What used to be the realm of mystics is now simply the realm of biological mechanisms of action with better scanners, better measurements, fMRIs, EEGs, all these things. What used to be the domain of priests and mythologies have now been revealed to be neurobiology. And what that lets people do is reverse engineer experiences that used to be housed in a lot of esoteric language, a lot of superstitions, and, and just do what we say because, and lets people reconnect these experiences for themselves. But fundamentally, yeah? I was I was just going to jump in and just give them an example. I wanted to give you an example of how far neurobiology has come in mapping and measuring this. So back in 1997, the very first time we decided it was a guy named Andrew Newberg. He was at the University of Pennsylvania. And he said, OK, I want to actually study mystical experiences. And he wanted to study the experience of unity, which is the sense of becoming one with everything. It is the most fundamental mystical experience there is. It shows up in pretty much every religion and every mystical tradition on earth and has forever, they call it the perennial philosophy for that reason. And so Dr. Newberg 
took Tibetan Buddhists and Franciscan nuns, both of whom experience a version of unity. For the Tibetan Buddhists, it's called absolute unitary being. It's oneness with the universe, oneness with God's love, excuse me, oneness with the universe. For the Franciscan nuns, it was unia mystica, which is oneness with God's love. Very similar experience, two different traditions. And he put them aside an fMRI scan. He actually used a spec scanner to different type of brain imaging technology. And he said, what's going on inside the brain? Now, mind you, in 1996, if you walked into a doctor's office and said, doc, you know, I, uh, I feel one with everything, he was gonna lock you up. It was a mental illness. It was not a mystical experience. You had a mental illness. What Dr. Newberg discovered is there turns out the right parietal lobe, it's a particular part of the brain, helps us separate self from other. You need this part of the brain to be able to kind of navigate through a crowd. So you walk through this crowd earlier without bumping into everybody. This is the portion of your brain that allowed you to do that. People who have a stroke or brain damage to this part of the brain, they can't say sit down on a couch. They don't know where their leg ends um, and the couch begins. So it turns out as we move into these states, again, it's an efficiency exchange, right? The brain wants more in meditation. The brain wants more energy for focus and attention. So it takes it away from the right parietal lobe. This portion of the brain shuts down. No energy in, no energy out. As a result, the brain concludes, it has to conclude, it has no other choice, that at that particular moment, you are one with everything. So in 1997, we got the first look at what's going on under the hood in a mystical experience. And, and he, he had to risk tenure track at Penn to yep. do this. So he to really did risk his career to do this. A lot of antagonism towards this research, still today, but back then for sure. It is now 15 years later, 16, 18 years later. My math is terrible right now. We have gone from decoding cosmic unity to we've looked at trance states. We've looked at speaking in tongues. We've looked at near-death experiences. We've looked at out-of-body experiences. The list of mystical experiences we have now mapped and measured under the hood is pretty complete. In fact, we've gone so far as there was work done last year. There's a vi in Kabbalistic Judaism, so in Jewish mysticism, there's a very obscure ritual that produces a doppelganger effect where you see your double and you can ask your double divine questions and get answers. Turns out, not only have we decoded that experience, what is producing it, but we have now created technology virtual reality technology that can allow anybody to experience it. So over a, essentially less than two decades, we've gone from mystical experiences are enough to get you locked up to now, not only have we decoded all of them, we can reproduce a lot of them on demand. That's the shift in neurobiology that Jamie's talking about. All right, you guys ready? We're gonna do a seventh inning stretch. Everybody up. <laughs> okay. Up we jump, up we jump. <laughs> There we go. All right. Take some deep breaths. Doesn't that feel wonderful? Okay. Spin around. 360. And swap seats with your neighbor. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is there a reason we did that? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Brilliant. Some, somebody got shafted on that one. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. All right. So, so ba back to those notion of the four forces. Like, why now? What the hell's going on that's different, and why should we care about it? All right. So we talked about psychology. Stephen just unpacked neurobiology for us. There's two more. So the next one is pharmacology. And pharmacology is kind of the layup, right? Duh, of course. In fact, Oliver Sacks, like the famous uh, NYU neuroscientist, uh, famously said, he said, say what you will about psychedelics, but you know, they, they produce transcendence on demand. And so there's no question. I mean, you can sit in meditation for decades and maybe something profound happens, maybe not much profound happens. And you have to constantly make that trade-off of every other way I could spend my time and attention, do I get the ROI I'm looking for? And you know, we're very much a culture these days of just-in-time learning. Give me what I need, when I want it, right now, with as little fuzz as possible. So one thing that psychoactives have done is they've, they've done two things. One is they've massively expanded the data set for revelation. 
So if you think back to like Joseph Smith or Moses, right? So Joseph Smith, you know, famously in 1821 came down the hillside from his, you know, back back of his house in New York and said, I've got a golden trapper keeper given to me by the angel Moroni. And it tells this wild ass story of like of the lost tribes of Israel coming to North America a long ass time ago. And everyone's like, oh my God, that sounds like a crazy story. Let's take a look. And he's like, yeah, well, that's the thing, right? Uh, angel took it back. Don't have it anymore. You got to take my word for it. Right? And Moses did the same thing. Moses comes down, hair on fire from, from uh, Mount Sinai, and says, Some bitch, people. I got ten commandments written by the finger of God. And they're raging. They're like having a super bender for the god Baal. And, he, and he's pissed. And he's like, God damn it. And he slams the tablets, shatters them. And the whole raid is the lost ark, like Ark of the Covenant. The whole, those things were copies. They weren't even the real deal. So the, the Hebrew people, too, had to take Moses' word for it. So we had this notion of one to many revelation, right? Ecstasis, these non-ordinary states, was rare, really hard to replicate. And if somebody did get lucky, right, and the lightning struck them, the only way to validate it was take their word for it or listen to the, after the fact, the retroactive origin stories of their followers. So kind of a raw deal for the rest of us, right? But there, there's, a, there's a fascinating, you know, just tiny subset uh, of a category. These days, you guys are, you know, there's wikis online for everything. Well, there, there are wikis online now for uh, the experiences rendered under dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is a very potent psychedelic. And what's fascinating is they've created an entire lexicon that they call the hyperspace lexicon. So people, uh, there, was a, there was a federal study at the University of New Mexico in the 90s uh, on this subject, and then it kind of broadened and became this kind of underground uh, culture. But what they've been doing is they've been crowdsourcing the revelatory experiences produced by interacting with this compound. And the funny thing is, is they have the you know, furthest out shit happening, wild and crazy, but they always bracket it with don't believe everything you think. It may feel like this. It may feel exclusively true. It may seem like it's the end of the world or that you're new, the new God or whatever, but you might not be, right? So that degree of large data being applied to big questions is one of the, was one of the biggest things that happens. It, it cuts out the cult leader. It cuts out the demagogue. Right? It cuts out somebody who would be tempted to say, my way is the highway, and no one else has a chance to weigh in. And so what we're really seeing is a grand sort of, as I said, like, like if anybody's familiar with uh, Fermi, the Fermi paradox, or Enrico Fermi, the famous physicist, right, who was a genius at making estimates based on like how many piano tuners are there in Chicago or how many stars are there in the galaxy. And he would just use kind of logic to blow it out, and he would be surprisingly close within an order of magnitude from the actual numbers, you know, figured out decades later. And so what, where we are today is almost sort of like, like Fermi, like doing a Fermi estimate on the big questions of existence. But we're using not just one person to many, but many to many. And so we're kind of democratizing the, the revelation. And it doesn't mean we're there yet, but it does mean we've got a lot more data points. And then the other benefit of pharmacology is that because it can prompt a state shift on demand, we're able to start measuring and researching insights that would have otherwise been impossible to track down. So you can't wait for someone like Joan of Arc out there in the gardens, where, you know, and angels just happen to come and start talking to her. You can't time that when Joan's session is in the, in the fMRI machine, right, at the university. But you can time, hey, ingest MDMA, ingest you know, three grams of psilocybin and just something. And we know neurochemically you will be in a non-ordinary state of consciousness and we can map that. And Robin Carhart Harris at Imperial College of London has been doing exactly that with the, with the latest round of LSD studies. And with that in combination with the new fMRI machines that don't just take static pictures, they can kind of take streaming reads, he's been able to get under, underneath the mysteries of self-consciousness and subconsciousness. And what he's finding is revolutionary for psychology and neurobiology. And it wouldn't be possible if we didn't have the ability to prompt these experiences and then measure them on demand. So those are the two big things, crowdsourcing epiphany, right? And being able to further explore the nature of mind by priming conditions we want to then me measure and manage. And then the last one is technology. And how many folks have uh, been to a good electronic show, uh, you know, like just EDM kind of music, or and has even have heard of something like Function One sound system, right? So there are, you know, it used to be that I mean, dancing 
and music have always been time-honored techniques of ecstasy. They've always been one of the main ways people get together to get it on, right? To, to join together. I mean, even like rock and roll Jesus Church have taken that. I mean, they've gone out of the kind of the stuffy Anglican or Catholic ways, and there's folks up there with guitars and jumbotrons and keyboards, right? They're getting the Holy Ghost feeling going on. So, like, it's, it's prevalent wherever you go. And what's happening now with access to incredibly amplified acoustics and audio and VR and projection mapping. Did anybody see um, the Android Jones's projections on the Empire State Building or on the UN? There was a time when it was like Kali was like projected on the side of the Empire State Building and they did an entire series of projection maps of big visuals on the side of the UN building as well for sustainability, you know, projects like that. So we're taking art and immersive visuals off canvases, off walls, and we're now projecting them not just onto 2D surfaces like buildings where thousands of people can interact with them at once. We're now getting into truly immersive 3D spaces. And so the ability to bend and shape consciousness with amplified acoustics, with amplified visuals, right, is, is starting to realize that we can now have a state-shifting experience not just with a dozen people or a hundred people or even a thousand people but a quarter of a million people. Electric Daisy Carnival, Ultra Fest down in Miami, some of these larger festivals, quarter of a million, 300,000 people at a time, all in the same state. And so you take all these together, psychology, neurobiology, pharmacology, and technology, and what we're realizing is they basically do, do three things. They make access to these states safer and more scalable, and they cut out the middlemen or the gatekeepers. So every one of us has the keys to the kingdom right now. And that is novel compared to any other time in human history. It's always been closely guarded or repressed. It's always been meted out in small doses for social control. And any efforts to jumpstart this individually has been met with violent opposition and repression. So you may say, hey, four forces are here, right? We're in clover, it's all good. Um, but it's not quite all good. And there are actually still some significant perils to pulling this off. And, and Stephen's going to walk us through a few of them. One thing I wanted to add before, before I go into how this can go so horribly wrong um, is each of these forces uh, and, and kind of the revolution they're driving forward appear to be accelerating exponentially. So exponential growth, unlike linear growth, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exponential growth is a doubling. Two becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, and so forth. Technology is famously accelerating exponentially, right? The classic example is Moore's Law, which basically says, <coughs> back in 1965, Gordon Moore noticed that the you know, number of integrated circuits on a computer chip had been doubling 18, every 18 months. He went, wow, this is cool, this is amazing. I bet it's gonna last 10 more years, and 20 more years, 30, 40, 50, we're up, moving up on 70 years. Moore's Law is the reason that the smartphone in your pocket is a million times faster and a thousand times cheaper than a supercomputer from the 1970s. So Ray Kurzweil, who was the head of engineering at Google, discovered that once a technology becomes an information technology, right, once you can translate into the ones and zeros of computer code, it jumps on the back of Moore's Law and begins accelerating exponentially. Psychology, becomes, because it's becoming a big data science, is now accelerating exponentially. Technology is accelerating exponentially. Pharmacology, again, has become an information science. Same thing with neurobiology. So these forces which are driving this revolution, they themselves are accelerating. So what is powerful now is only gonna get more powerful tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. Which brings us to how this could go so horribly wrong. We've seen this before, right? We've done this before, and it's gone wrong before. Three ways that it typically does go wrong. The first way is obviously hedonism, right? These are very powerful experiences. They seem to be very, very good for us. They seem to unlock skills we can't access any other way. But those neural chemicals that drive that effortlessness, that drive that motivation, are also very, very addictive, right? Dopamine is one of the most addictive substances on earth. And it's interesting, if you think about social media, if you think about smartphones, right, alcohol produces dopamine, right? That's what the, it, yeah, that's one of the reasons alcohol can be so addictive. We have a drinking age. There's a reason for it, right? We don't have a smartphone age. We happily give them to children to use. <clears throat> 
So these are very, 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 they, these can be very, very sticky and dangerous states to play with. And there are ways to do it safely, and there are ways it can go wrong. The other two ways are, are much more interesting. So commercialization and militarization are the two ways. And I think the, when I wrote The Rise of Superman, which was a book about flow, the very first two groups of people who reached out to us, the Advertising Research Foundation, which is the largest foundation of advertisers in the world, and the military. Those were the first two groups of people. Everybody else went, oh, flow states, these are great. Maybe I can use these to kind of improve my life. These guys saw immediately spotted a competitive advantage and wanted to know more. There's sort of a long history of these things going on. Why don't you talk about commercialization a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll actually even just jump to the, the militarization or the weaponization of consciousness, right? So, so this seems like true tinfoil hat land. You're like, seriously, is this really what's going on? But if you think about it, right, the ability to create those experiences where your self disappears, where time goes away, where everything feels effortless and self-compelling or propelling, and you have access to tons of information, uh, t turned on their heads, used for the dark arts, right, is the same as schizophrenia, mind control, right, um, you know, truth serums, and all these other breakdowns. And this goes back at least half a century, as early as 1953. Is anybody familiar with sensory deprivation, sensory deprivation or float tanks? Have you guys heard of those, those terms? Okay, that is a hat tip to Dr. John Lilly, who was the guy who originally invented those. And back in 1953, he was a hot shit young researcher at Penn. And he was doing research on pleasure with primates, so monkeys. And he, would, he pioneered the very first sleeves that you could insert into someone, through someone's skull into a brain to stimulate different regions of the brain to get different responses. And, you know, all the way from your prefrontal cortex all the way down to your amygdala, like the true kind of lizard brain fight or flight land. Right? And what he found in monkeys was that the pleasure circuits were directly connected to the sexual arousal circuits. And interestingly, if, if, you could, if, a, male, if a male rhesus monkey could self-stimulate, he would, to orgasm, 16 hours a day, after which he would take a six-hour nap and get right back up and keep going. So, so like that, that's, that's male primates in a nutshell, right? So, um, <laughs> But interestingly, right, um, he, he had pioneered ways to do it so that you could tap those sleeves in. You, it was p virtually painless. You could leave them in for months at a time. And suddenly, everybody, everybody from all the three-letter agencies came knocking. And the reason they had such an urge was that 1953, heart of the Korean War, and a lieutenant colonel marine pilot named Charles Schwabel was shot down over North Korea. And they interrogated him. And he actually spilled the beans. He's like... I had biological weapons. I was ordered to deploy them over civilian population centers. And that was the drill. And he went on Chinese radio and actually confessed that. So the Pentagon was hosed because they, they, there's this decorated war veteran, right, that's in enemy hands, throwing them under the bus, effectively, for violations of Geneva war crimes. And they're like, what the hell do we do? Because if we abandon him, that's going to look terrible. If we cop to it, that's going to look even worse. So they literally concocted out of thin air, and they've been testing this even in like op-eds in the New York Times, um, menticide, mind murder. And, and, and they realized, oh, we can say that the Koreans basically got inside his head, scrambled his brain, and what he's saying isn't true. Now, the PR folks were like, menticide, are you serious? That's clunky as all hell. Let's call it brainwashing. Let's do that. What do you think? And so that's what it became. We might all nod. You guys have heard of the Manchurian candidate. There's even been conversations in the last few months. We might be looking at another one. Um, and, <laughs> right? But that notion that a totalitarian state could hijack your individuality and free will right, and redirect you for nefarious purposes, it was actually sown as a counterintelligence program to get us off the hook for biological warfare. But funny thing, spooks being spooks, right? They actually started believing their own hype. So they pushed it out to a mainstream America, and America's like, ooh, brains, communist brainwashers, terrible. But then they started becoming so obsessed with it, even though they'd made it up themselves, they became so obsessed with it, they become desperate to figure out how to do it before it could be done to us, right? So that's where they come back to the pleasure monkeys, and they come tracking down John Lilly, and they literally, for, you know, like, he's like, look, guys, I know this could be used to hijack selfhood, and I'm not gonna do it unless I open source all the results. So he took a stand way back in 1953 for open sourcing the information and access to ecstasis. Those guys took his research and ended up creating an atomic donkey. 
It was the Super Mule Project <laughs> conducted by Sandia Labs, right, on New Mexico, defense contractor. Same, same pleasure probes, and they put a compass and a suitcase nuke on a mule. And if it veered off the compass trackings, it would, be pain, it, would be, it would be punished with pain through its brain. And if it stayed on track, it would be rewarded with pleasure. And like three years later, it came out in Harper's Magazine. There was a little piece. And John Lilly saw the very same guy that had come to his, his lab to do the research. He's like, oh, my God, I can't do this research anymore. Right? It's going to get co-opted. Has anybody read the books like Men Who Stare at Goats or seen that movie with George Clooney? Right? So fast forward to the 70s, same thing. Right? You have Project MKUltra in the 60s, which is where Ken Kesey, right, who, the guy who wrote One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, was working at Stanford, famously you know, hijacked some LSD from the medicine cabinet at the VA hospital that he was doing his research for One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, and created the West Coast psychedelic culture. Right? In the 70s, the military tries to sort of be like, what, what's up with all the hippies, man? Let's go figure out their shit. And you get men who stare at goats. You get military officers hot tubbing at Esalen, trying to figure out what's happening in the human potential movement. Can they bring it back in? And Jim Channon, who was their number one agent, comes back and writes this loopy first Earth Battalion manual of like creating like next generation Earth Guardians as soldiers, and they can encounter the enemies with sparkly eyes, and they can practice meditation and yoga. I mean, really sweet but fruity stuff and and there was a little footnote a little footnote in that little manual and it said hey you can use music to soothe and pacify and create connection between people or you could use discordant music to disorient enemy combatants and of course fast forward to Abu Ghraib in Iraq right everybody remembers that one Right? And what was happening there, you guys may even remember it from the news cycle where there was kind of this joking little bit about like, oh, I've heard they're playing the Barney, I love you, you love me song, right? A thousand times under bright lights. Oh, that would drive me crazy too. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Over to you, Bill, with the weather, right? And actually what they'd done is they'd taken that human potential movement stuff, turned it on its head, and were using sonic distortion, right, for psychological warfare. So back and forth, back and forth, we've had this perpetual game between what you might call the spooks of the intelligence community and the kooks of the counterculture and going back and forth on who controls access to this ecstasis and can it be used in service of a nation state or can it be used to liberate human consciousness? And then the next one, which is a little less scary depending on your orientation or potentially totally scary, because it's already here now, is commodification or commercialization. <clears throat> one of the, and, and the most obvious example of this is, of course, neuromarketing, which you know, we, was, was a hot button topic kind of in the early 2000s when we first started looking inside the brain. And one of the actually first things, Martin Lingstrom was the guy who did this research, he discovered that the exact same centers of the brain that light up when we have a religious experience tend to light up when we have a strong brand experience. So this got blown totally out of proportion in the media and there was a lot of backlash against it. But it's very, very true that stimulating these same states can make us want to buy things. I always, we always tell people when we, when we do flow work, right? when you're in a flow state, don't go shopping. Everything looks good when you have a lot of norepinephrine and dopamine running through your system. Your pattern recognition system is all jacked up. You'll buy all kinds of crazy shit. And you'll come home and you go, what did, I, what did I do? Right? These neurochemicals are very, very powerful and they can very easily be co-opted to sell us more things. And one of, the, one of the kind of the classic examples of this, Kevin Kelly was writing about this in Wired Magazine a couple months ago, and he was talking about, hey, you know, we, if you look at your smartphone in your pocket, smartphone is gathering a lot of data about you as we go along. It's kind of surveilling you at, at, as we walk around. Virtual reality, we're giving it a whole other level of data for virtuality to work, to enhance the user experience. It's not just where are you, right, that you're just GPS, those sorts of things, but it's what are your biometrics, what's your heart rate doing, what's your pupil eye gaze doing. All these things are important in virtual reality because they can enhance the experience. But this is fundamental data about our neurobiology that can very easily be co-opted to sell us more stuff. <clears throat> Yeah, so, so, so that is, I mean, there we have it, right? The, the, I think if, if we would like you guys to leave with anything from tonight, 
um, A, you know, it would be permission to come out of the closet as, as an ecstatic. If, if any of these techniques, if any of these practices have been significant for you in your life, but they may have been fragmented, or you may have sometimes felt that they were um, wrong or immature or distracted or whatever it would be, um, just to understand, oh, they may be of a feather. There may be a logic to my seeking and to my choices that I didn't realize. Uh, and that there's an awful lot of evidence to support and validate that seeking. So if there's a surfboard in your garage you're reluctant to let go of, if you still pine away for those days where you used to dance all night to music, if you're missing right, some deep connection with a lover or a partner and wondering how to get that back, just know that instinct um, is coming from a really solid place that a number of other people share. And, and the final part is, what can we do with all this? Because if now's the time, if this truly is an inflection point, if this truly is different than every time in the past where basically you have established orthodoxies, controlling and micromanaging it, you have little outgroups occasionally figuring this out and getting squashed, right? What chance do we have today and what do we do with this? Because it's not just to feel good, right? And what we don't have time to go into today is you know, some of the, the research validated benefits of it, but in a nutshell, successfully pursuing these states and integrating them into our lives can help us heal from some of the profoundest traumas humans experience. Childhood abuse, sexual trauma, war trauma, uh, the results on these studies, regardless of which mechanisms you use, whether it's flow states, whether it's med meditation and mindfulness, whether it's psychedelic therapy, all of them have comparably similar results because it's that change of channel and it's that release and reset that is so profoundly healing. So they can heal us they can also massively accelerate learning and innovation as that University of Sydney study that Stephen shared can demonstrate. And they can also bond us together to perform and tackle grand challenges. And if you think about it, I mean, if you compare, you know, Hillary's vaunted ga ground game in this past election versus Trump's rallies and zero ground game, zero organizational infrastructure state by state, and everyone was baffled afterwards, like, what the hell? How did that happen? Well, how it happened is that Trump leveraged the, commu the power of communitas. What happens when people connect? And what happens when they feel defined by a tribe, defined by an other, right, and feel a powerful state shift? You can make a case. It's why intuitively he's continuing to do rallies right now, because that's how he's continuing to prime our base. What did Hillary have? Bless her cotton socks. She had policy wonk platform stuff, right? The last time, right, Bernie activated Communitas on the progressive side. Obama 08 did something comparable, right? And unless progressives figure out how to reignite that part, they're gonna get their asses handed to them all day long. And what's possible here is if we can integrate these things, if we can understand cognitive literacy, how does my body and my brain affect my mind and my heart and who else is trying to get my mind share with or without my permission? Then we can potentially take a stand for what we believe in. And then it's not asymmetrical warfare. And, and I want to leave you guys with one, with one potential notion. And this is a little bit of like dorky developmental psych, but if you'll bear with me to set it up, I hope it pays off. Which is, in order for us to reach a level of psychological development, like egocentric, right, a little, the terrible twos kid, right? In order for that terrible twos kid to move into the stage of being egocentrically oriented, he has to separate from his mommy. He has to realize there's a, there's a you in order to define himself as an I. In order to move to the next step, to ethnocentric, right, our, our tribe. In order to define our tribe, there has to be an other. So I have to constantly go beyond the level I'm moving into in order to define and integrate that level. In order to move beyond ethnocentric, right, to global centric, right? I actually, what does it take for us to have global centric perspective? Well, it would follow, we have to go beyond the globe. We have to go to a cosmic centric perspective. So what does cosmocentric look like and how the hell do we get there, right? Well, if you take a look at the astronauts, they're probably the, the initial subset that just via technological engineering and ingenuity have had an experience beyond global perspective. They've looked back at this little blue marble, they've seen the sunrise come up behind it and said, oh my God.
They've watched the earth rotate. They've seen the Ganges. They've seen the Nile. They've seen the Amazon. They've seen it go. And they've said, we are all together down there. And these states of ecstasis do something comparable for us. Right? They, they don't physically transport us. Right? They mentally transport us beyond ourselves, beyond our fragmentation and our isolation. And if we think about social justice, environmental justice, which is what Azlaj and John are doing right, with this project, with the One Project, right, what, is, what is it about? I mean, you can make a case these days that there are no more boundaries, there are no more divisions. There's not, oh, I'm an environmentalist or I'm a social activist. Right? I mean, look at the Dakota Pipeline. Right? I mean, social justice, environmental justice, it's all coming together. We're in this. So the possibility is, can we use these states to inform us, inspire us, and take a stand? Can we use these states responsibly to be courageous in the face of what we face? Can we use them to be more innovative and creative? And if we can do that, then maybe this revolution stands a chance of succeeding just in time. We've got a little bit of time for a couple of questions, but you guys have been really, really patient, so I don't want to stretch this out too long. Anybody have quick questions, or should we just all go drink? <laughs> Please. Not to regress, but can you just describe the flow state? Because I think that's where I think most of us gain the most energy and the most deviceness, the most um, direction in life. And um, so When you say describe it. Like describe it. I mean, I don't like... Okay, so I quick... Like I'm, I'm, what it, what it, so. Where, when am I actually feeling it? I feel like I feel like it all the time. Well, um, that's. So. Uh, okay. Does that happen for a lot of people or does it not? I, I just don't. Lock her up. <laughs> Lock her up. <laughs> it does, but I don't so, think it does. um. Because I don't relate to a lot of people a lot of times because I feel like I'm in the flow state most of the time in my life. That's interesting. Um. So. And I don't want to be stuck in the no, flow state. It, that's interesting. I've, I've never been anybody who's complaining about stuck in flow. One of the things that we do know... That, that, that right there is a first world problem. <laughs> so, flow is an optimal state of consciousness, right, where we feel our best and we perform our best, right? And more specifically, you know, for anybody who's not super familiar, we should have done this at the beginning and not the end it refers to those moments of rapt attention and total absorption where we get so focused on the task at hand that everything else disappears, right? Self disappears, time disappears, and all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. Now, um, back in the 70s and 80s, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi was the head of the University of Chicago Psychology Department, it's often referred to as the godfather of flow psychology, made a number of, of core discoveries about flow, and one of which, and I think this sort of speaks to your question a little bit, is that flow is a spectrum experience, right? So there are seven to 10, depending on whose list you want to believe, core characteristics of flow. We've just listed a bunch of them. There's absolutely focused concentration, this vanishing of self, this distortion of time, so forth. So if you have a couple of those characteristics showing up, you are in a state of microflow that can go all the way up to a state of macroflow when all seven to ten of them show up at once. Until the 50s or 60s, macroflow was often called a mystical experience. We just thought it was a mystical experience. Uh, the early research done on flow uh, back in, you know, the turn of the century was done by a uh, Harvard psychologist, William James. And William James talked about flow as a mystical experience. So it wasn't until Abraham Maslow came along in the 50s, another psychologist, he was studying peak experiences or flow states as well. It, he was, he noticed a couple things. One, he noticed that he was studying success. He wanted to know what do all successful people have in common. One of the things he found is that they all have found ways to shift their consciousness and produce flow states. Funny thing though, Everybody in his patient population, everybody he was studying, was an atheist. So suddenly, oh, wait a minute, this isn't a religious experience, this isn't a mystical experience, maybe this is a psychological experience. But, so there's a spectrum experience. Now, under normal conditions, you can't 
really live in a perpetual flow state. In fact, every couple of months, somebody comes up to us and, and says something like, hey, I live in a perpetual flow state. Um, you should study me. You, you Usually in all block caps and like a six-page Facebook message. Yeah. And I tend to, you know, I'm fairly honest. I'm like, you know, we, we, we have certain specific words for, for, for people who live in flow states. We normally call them schizophrenics. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons is... Um, and it's, it's really, it, one of the, it's not at you, engagement, which is, you know, low-grade engagement, feels very similar to flow, and nobody is quite sure, by the way, where the hell is the line between engagement and flow? It's a, it's a very, it's a murky problem, and we don't quite know how to solve it yet at all. But one of the reasons is those neurochemicals I talked about, right, that show up in flow, they're pretty expensive for the brain and the body to produce. So, for example, for anybody who's done MDMA, Molly, right, you know that a couple days after the experience, you're very depressed. Why? Because you have no more serotonin in your system, right? And it takes a little while. You need sunlight. You need certain chemicals. You need certain minerals. Same thing with the neurochemicals that show up in flow. So one of the reasons you can't live in flow perpetually is because those neurochemicals exhaust themselves and they need to replenish themselves. Um, does that answer your question? How'd I do? Same drug. Okay. Molly's up. Yeah. Okay. Right. Same drug. Well, you. Please. Yeah. Can you guys hear the questions? You want me to repeat yeah, it? Do we want to right get a mic? Awesome. Thanks, John. Do you think with, um, with the rise of sort of like wearable tech and things like that that, that, that are coming out and, and being able to map your sort of neurobiology so specifically, um, do you think that there's going to be any I don't know, sort of just further distancing people between like sort of the natural world and the environment and the things that maybe, um, you know, would help cause somebody or contribute to somebody entering a flow state, whether it be like meditating or, you know, I mean, sort of, I so, mean, so it, just, just the technology just gonna that. isolate you, okay. you know? Specifically um, like immersive stuff or actually I mean, specifically like, like and... you know, I mean, where we no longer have our smartphones one day when it just becomes like a wearable tech, when it's something that's on you all the time. Mm -hmm. um, is that going to be used, do you think? I mean, to The singularity is near. Well, you know, I mean, I'm just <laughs> yeah. curious, you know, when you talk about sort of compounded progress and how much faster technology gets every single year or two years or 18 months. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, there's no question that like this posture that we've been adopting for the last decade is going to be as time stamped and hokey as like handlebar mustaches and bell bottoms. There's, absolutely. I mean, it, it, we will be off these dorky ass screens we have to carry around in probably less than five years, I guess. You know, and, and Google Glass and Snap Glasses and those kind of things are just the beginnings. But yeah, we're, we're going in that direction. Um, interestingly, uh, Elon Musk in a, in a private conversation with Reid Hoffman, they were talking about the singularity, they were talking about, you know, are we going to be taken over by, by AI and all that kind of stuff. And his his thought was the only hope for humanity is neural nets, like basically ingesting nanotechnology that then basically hops up our brains and lets us compete against the robots. <laughs> little little dog, but you know, there you go. That's a Silicon Valley conversation. Um, but, but for the rest of us, you know, the good news could be like smart tech and wearables if and when, and it shouldn't be too long, and some of the DARPA level stuff is already there, but as it trickles down to the rest of us, there's enough biofeedback that can give us steer in real time. So not just like, oh, uh, at the at day's end, did I have many steps for calories and get my little badge, but like nudging me. A little buzz here, a little, a little you know, bell or chime here, just steering me into tuning my states of consciousness. And once we can do that with a little bit of tech assist, all of our psychological problems become a different level solution. I don't, I don't need necessarily all the couch time. I don't need to sit kvetching with my friends and telling stories about my, my problem narratives. Right? You can literally just steer your neurophysiology into an optimal state. And then it's not that, you know, there's that old Zen joke, which is like you don't ever find the answer to the meaning of life. You just stop asking the question. <laughs> and so we may be fairly close to an inflection point on how we even conceive of ourselves psychologically based on how much we can tune and optimize everything else. But to your point about do we disappear into the virtual and does it take us away from a full embodiment and expression? Is that kind of the heart well, of what no, you're I mean, saying? Is it, does, it, does, it, does, it, does it contribute to us continuing to kind of detach mm -hmm. from the natural world? No. Is so that's sort of what I mean, or does it help? I mean, because you guys, the, initially with Rise of Superman, that sort of thing, you're talking about extreme sport, people who are like, 
are immersed in their act, the natural world and their environment and using these sort of heightened states. Yeah, so. Um, I'm talking about, yeah, so um, whether or not you no longer need to do that. If that's not going to be what you need to do to get to that sort of heightened flow state anymore, that you're going to be able to wear something yeah. and it's going to be able to either, you know, trickle something into your body or brain or, or alter, you know, I don't know. So you're, you're actually, your instinct is right on. So one of the things that we know is flow states have triggers, right? One of them is we, we talk about it as a rich environment, lots of novelty, lots of complexity, lots of unpredictability. One of the reasons action sport athletes who I talked about in Rise are so good at producing flow is because they live in the natural world, which has, they perform in the natural world, lots of novelty, lots of complexity, lots of unpredictability, right? That's, that's the point. What else produces lots of novelty, complexity, and unpredictability? VR. In fact, probably better than the natural world. So VR is really good for priming flow, or it appears to be really, really good for priming flow. Now, this has a phenomenal upside. For example, one of the things that we know in flow, and this was research done by kind of DARPA uh, and our friends of ours at Advanced Brain Monitoring, and they found that snipers in flow, for example, learned target acquisition skills 470% faster than normal, massively accelerated learning, right? The, the UN's doing empathy in, in, in refugees with Syria in VR. So, so there's a lot of positive things that can come from it as well. Where I, where I was going with that, very similar, is you can use VR to create, because it can produce these conditions that drive people into flow, and we learn faster in flow, you can create immersive, accelerated environments. So I think the future of education is going to take place in VR. One of the main reasons is we can accelerate learning in VR because we can use this technology, drop people into flow very, very quickly, accelerate learning. That's a really good, big upside. The tricky point, the other question is, if you can produce flow in VR, you can also produce all these feel-good neurochemicals, right? Flow, uh, and this was Csikszentmihalyi's research from back in the 70s and 80s, flow is often considered the most meaningful state on Earth. People who have the most flow in their lives tend to score off the charts on overall well-being and life satisfaction. So this means that in VR, we're soon going to be able to create experiences, we may soon, be able to create experiences that are not only more pleasurable or as pleasurable as the most pleasurable states on earth, um, they're also extremely addictive. So we could start moving into VR for the very reasons you're talking about now. Are we gonna go that way? I have no idea. Yeah, I think Neil Postman, the, the, the critic at NYU, you know, he famously said George Orwell in 1984 was afraid that our fears will ruin us and, and Aldous Huxley in A Brave New World was afraid that our, our pleasure will ruin us. And if you think about that, that dystopian world in, in Brave New World, it was, you know, Soma was the substance they took. And he said, you know, all the benefits of Christianity and alcohol and none of the defects, right? And they sat around popping that stuff and engaging in orgy porgies and no one, you know, no one gave a fuck. So, you know, even last week I saw a study on VR that was basically saying people are starting to get VR hangovers. After they've spent time in VR, they're, they're coming out and the world seems flat and it seems uninteresting. And they're even having cerebellar processing. So their, their spatial orientation, like the initial, the whoopsie weirdness of going into VR, once you kind of get your sea legs and then you try to come back to regular 3D reality, that, that becomes equally disorienting and it's even affecting brain function. So how many of us willingly jack into the matrix? Not, not, not some bad computer making it happen to us, but we're like, screw it, man. I'll, t I'll forget the red pill. Just give me the blue ones, <laughs> right? Is, is a legit issue. Yeah. Well, I have a question as far as like the definition of flow versus ecstasy. And I'm almost wondering if we're maybe not talking about the same thing. Um, as we're, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> as we're kind of talking about the, uh, the dangerous states versus the positive states and that razor's edge of a productive result. And it reminded me, as people were bringing this up, um, of a story I once heard on a, a Thanksgiving, which is very random. I was visiting a, a, a Catholic friend who was talking about the challenges of what was going on in the church. Uh, they were from Boston. And someone else who was there, uh, who used to be a Catholic monk, randomly, um, and had left, and that was now like a copywriter at Bloomingdale's, which is what my friend also did. So I ended up there, and I was hearing his story 
Um, and he was saying that in every, every um, powerful uh, state or every functioning state, and it's the human body, the family, a company, a country, anything, there are two sides. There are the mystics and there are the administrators. Uh, I guess that could be interpreted as like masculine and feminine as well. Um, and when you have uh, any state of abuse or dysfunction, um, he said the administrators, when they get too strong, you have a state of war. And the mystics, when they're st too strong, you have a state of sex abuse, was his interpretation of that. It probably could be many other interpretations of a dysfunctional state. Um, he was just trying to explain the situation. So for him, it was balance. It wasn't ecstasy. And I sort of like, I remembered that always. And then randomly, I would sometimes see that. Like, when anything becomes dysfunction, so is flow, would you say, possibly a state of balance and not a state of ecstasy? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the simple things is, yes, balance. Um, and, and do the hard things and round out the corners. The, the reason why what we're talking about is potentially revolutionary today now is, is not that um, you know, all ecstasis all the time solves anything. We've all got day jobs, we've got hard shit to do. And you need level head, you need functioning, well-integrated egos to, to execute a lot of it. Um, the real thing is that our society, from you know, the French Enlightenment till now, has, be, has been built around rational individualism. And that's one channel of consciousness. And most other you know, cultures throughout history have had multiple channels of consciousness. Dreams, visions, portents, right? you know, uh, ceremonies, all sorts of things that they considered valid and different channels you could hang out on and information would be legit and integrated. Right? You wouldn't say, you know, like in, in, in Haitian voodoo ceremonies, right? for instance, people allow for possession and they freak out. You know, for, for a couple of festivals a year. And interestingly, psychosis is, virtu is, is far, far lower than in Western societies. They get their yayas out through an approved alternate channel of consciousness. Or in, you know, Eastern Europe, I just had this crazy dream. They don't say, oh, here's your breakfast, eat your Wheaties. They're like, well, what did it say? What did it mean? Right? So it's just that we, focus, we, we narrowed the aperture to an absolutely exclusive, rational, separate, egoic identity, and we've just stayed on that channel. And anytime anybody has any problems with the channel or starts veering, we just medicate them and say, come on back to ish here. So the, the benefit of ecstasis is not go over there exclusively. It's just add it. Add it to the toolkit. Add it to the spectrum of information we can. And when we balance it, we have greater performance. We have, we have greater, you know, greater options. I think we have time for one more. Make it a good one. Um, <clears throat> hi, I, um, I enjoyed your overview of emergent human consciousness for a lot of reasons, one of which I was the preceding guest writer on that stage a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Talked about my book, Swarm, which is a science fiction novel uh, that's about when the things you're talking about fall into the wrong hands and what could happen but the book ends with an appendix called The Brief History of Mind Control that's completely factual and leads from Tesla, I would say. Um, experiments in government mind control go back to Tesla uh, before World War II. <clears throat> but uh, it ends with, you mentioned the commercialization. I think the, one of the most important things you said that almost got buried toward the end was that we have to not just own, but fight to uh, protect uh, the, the effects of ecstasis and emergent consciousness because they can be controlled. And we're at a place right now where there are, uh, as you mentioned, uh, commercial products going on the market that are asking for access to your brain. <clears throat> and most people say, well, what's a big deal? It makes me feel better, it makes me run faster, it makes me sleep better, you know, get a bigger erection. Um, the problem is, we know from social media that we have a tendency as human beings to be lured into convenience. Anything that makes us feel better or do better, uh, we tend not to question it. On top of that, it turns out millennials who grew up, who use technology and social media instinctively are not very good at understanding what it means or what the trade-offs are by buying into those things. So it seems to me we're very close to kind of a, a, a potential cliffhanger here where once, as we know, once you give permission <coughs> for something to go in, it never leaves. So I wanted to hear more about what you thought about that and how we can protect ourselves from potentially, basically, brain hacking, which is not a futuristic phenomenon, but something that's happening right now. But yeah. Um, I, you know, Jamie mentioned it, and, uh, you know, John Lilly 
took a, a, a very poignant stand for open sourcing these technologies, these ideas. And that's the same stand we take in the book. It's, it seems to be the only, the only solution, right, is that these things belong to everybody and everybody gets to be a part of it. So our, our position on that is open sourcing the technologies of ecstasis is, and that keeps us ahead of the efforts to militarize them or commercialize them. And for anybody that's interested in the deep dive on that, uh, Tim Wu, who's at Columbia, uh, wrote an amazing book called The Master Switch. He's also the fellow that coined the term net, net neutrality back in the day. Uh, but in a nutshell, his argument in The Master Switch, which we adopt uh, in, in Stealing Fire, is that any information technology, from radio and telegraph back in the day all the way to TV, film, and now the internet, starts out democratic and utopian. So kind of all the cool stuff we were talking about earlier, and ends up hegemonic and centrally controlled every single time. And his, his advocacy, and we, we would make the case that these, these, you know, that ecstasis, these techniques of ecstasy are an information technology. They're just virtual, they're perceptual. So the stand is a stand for cognitive liberty. And the defense against that recurring cycle that happens every single time, we're fools to think it'll be different this time, is open sourcing getting out ahead of those efforts to consolidate the control and continuing to give power to the people in a really straightforward way. And who knows? I mean, it may not work. I would say it's slim odds. It's kind of Star Wars, small band of rebels against overwhelming dark forces. Can they pull it off in the nick of time? I mean, it's guts ball time. Um, and, and I would argue, and certainly I, I think with, with one as an organization, like it's time. We thought when we wrote this book, it was maybe a decade out. And then, you know, the fall happened and we're like, oh shit, it's on now. Yeah, I just started a website called ownyourmind.org to talk about that, so we should talk. Cool. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you so much for listening. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Awesome. Thank you.